You know, for far too many people, life's a game. One person said, he who dies with the most toys wins. Pretty frivolous view of life. And yet we are a, a game society. You see, before there was Halo, before Guitar Hero Michael Kirstner, before Super Mario Brothers, before Donkey Kong and Space Invaders, there was the original video game, Pong. 1974. And I must admit, I was pretty good at it. But even before then, there was a game a lot of children played. It's called Rock, Paper, Scissors. And it was just a matter you go, rock, paper, scissors. And at the end, you'd either go a scissor, or paper, or rock. And the opposing person do the same. Now, if you had the scissors and they had the paper, you won. Because scissor cuts paper. If you had the paper and they had the rock, you won because paper covers rock. And if you had the rock and they had the scissors, you won again because rocks crush scissors. Amen? So what's that got to do with our sermon today? Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 36. Read these words in verse 1. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words I've spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all the other nations from the time I began speaking to you in the reign of Josiah till now. Perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster I plan to inflict on them, each of them will turn from his wicked way. Then I will forgive their wickedness and their sin. Well, there's a lot right here in three verses that we need to grab a hold of if we're going to be able to fully appreciate this text. Right here, we're introduced to King Josiah, who is, of course, the dad of Jehoiakim, who's reigning at this particular time. Now, as mentioned right here, Jeremiah began his ministry under King Josiah. Now, Josiah was only eight years old, according to 2 Kings chapter 22 and 2 Chronicles 34, when he became king. And yet in the eighth year of his kingship, the Bible says he began to seek the Lord. This was amazing because Israel was in one of its darkest moments at this time. They'd just gone through the kingship of Manasseh and Ammon. And I mean, it was a horrific situation. And so for the young king to seek God, it was incredible. That was in the eighth year of his reign. We find from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, that in the 13th year of Josiah's reign, that's when Jeremiah began his ministry. And then we go back to 2 Kings and we find in the 18th year in Josiah's ring, they find in the temple the long lost book of the law. And the greatest revival recorded in all of the scriptures takes place under King Josiah and the prophetship of Jeremiah. Of course, what an incredible time for Israel. It was said that they celebrated the Passover unlike any king before, even beyond King David. The year, of course, that Josiah ascends the throne is about 640 B.C. He reigns 31 years as his life is cut short at 39 years old. And so he dies in 609 B.C. in a very tragic situation. He goes against the will of God, and he goes out to fight Pharaoh Necho of Egypt, and he dies. The Bible says that Jeremiah writes a lament for him. Of course, that's where we get lamentations. And we know that Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, but we probably don't fully understand why he's the weeping prophet. Well, Josiah's son then becomes king in his place. Let's look very quickly over 2 Kings. And we'll begin to see the heartache of this prophet. In 2 Kings 23, 
Josiah died, and immediately we read in verse 31, Jehoaz was 23 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem just three months. His mother's name was Hamilton, daughter of Jeremiah. Oh, my goodness. Josiah was the father-in-law. I mean, Jeremiah was the father-in-law of Josiah. And this is his grandson on the throne. His grandson had become so evil that Pharaoh Nicol takes him out of leadership and puts his half-brother, not the son of Hamutal, into leadership. That is Jehoiakim. Now it's 609 B.C. Here's the next interesting text, and we need to put this all together. In Daniel chapter 1, we find in the third year of Jehoiakim, that this is when Nebuchadnezzar comes against Israel and Jerusalem and takes the first group of exiles, being Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the hand of God is starting to come down here on Israel. Are you feeling it right here? Now, the text we're going to be getting into takes place in the fourth year. Now, let's get back to it if we could. The darkness is coming, and the gist of... Jeremiah's ministry is, ironically, the passage that Carlos presented for us at the beginning of the service. We always share with the other that God has a plan to prosper us. But connected to that was the prophecy that they would be 70 years in Babylon in exile, and then God would bring them back anew, back to Jerusalem. And the exciting thing that I think comes from this is to understand the irony of the time of Jeremiah. He presided over this great revival, but now God says, the land is so wicked, I'm going to have to send people into exile. Now, my message to my people is, just go quietly with Nebuchadnezzar. Now, never before had a prophet said, go with the enemy. So as you can see, this was a very unpopular message, particularly if you were king, Jehoiakim. And the sad thing is, the last king that presided over Jerusalem was another grandson of Jeremiah. His name was Zedekiah. If you do the math, you'll find that when Josiah died, Hamubal probably was pregnant at that time. And so the grief of Jeremiah comes not only within his physical family, but the spiritual family of Israel, and he is known as the weeping prophet. Let's get back to our text. Jeremiah Chapter 36. We find right here that God says, take a scroll and write on all the words I've spoken to you. Well, of course, that is what? It's the book of Jeremiah. So he writes down the scroll, these things, and so we read this in verse 4. So Jeremiah called Baruch, son of Neriah, and while Jeremiah dictated all the words the Lord had spoken to him, Baruch wrote them on the scroll. Then Jeremiah told Baruch, I'm restricted. I cannot go to the Lord's temple. So you are to go to the house of the Lord on the day of fasting and read it to the people from the scroll, the words of the Lord that I wrote and I dictated. Read them to all the people of Judah who come in from their towns. Perhaps they will bring their petition before the Lord and each will turn from his wicked ways. For the anger and wrath pronounced against these people by the Lord are great. Baruch, son of Neriah, did everything Jeremiah the prophet told him to do. At the Lord's temple, he read the words of the Lord from the scroll. Wow, that's a brave secretary right there. <laughs> Jeremiah goes, okay. Here's the book of Jeremiah. Here's all the things on, now on a scroll. Now, I'm restricted. I'm under house arrest. You've got to go to the temple and read these things to the people. Well, he reads it to the people, and inside of the crowd were some of the officials. Well, some of the officials heard it, and they said, Listen, Baruch, would you come to a secret meeting and read it again to all the top officials of the king? So we go on over to verse 15. They said to him, Sit down, please, and read it to us. So Baruch read it to them. When they heard all these words, they looked at each other in fear and said to Baruch, we must report all these words to the king. Then they asked Baruch, tell us, how did you come to write all of this? Did Jeremiah dictate it? Yes, Baruch said. He dictated all these words to me, and I wrote them in ink on the scroll. Then the official said to Baruch, you and Jeremiah, go and hide. Don't let anyone know where you're at. I mean, the prophecies of God can be scary. Amen, guys? Well, let's see what happens next. After they put the scroll in the room of Elisha, the secretary, they went to the king in the courtyard and reported everything to him. 
the king sent Jehudi to get the scroll. And Jehudi brought it from the room of Elisha, the secretary, and read it to the king and all the officials standing beside him. It was the ninth month, December, and the king was sitting in the winter apartment, part of the palace that was more insulated, with a fire burning in the fire pot in front of him. Whenever Jehudi had read three or four columns of the scroll, the king cut them off with a scribe's knife and threw them into the fire pot until the entire scroll was burned with fire. The king and all of his attendants who heard all these words showed no fear, nor did they tear their clothes. Wow. Now we understand. He took the scroll as Jehudi read it, took the knife, or dare we say as scissors cut paper. Verse by verse, he throws in the scriptures into the fire with no fear of God. Well, what happens? Verse 27. After the king had burned the scroll containing the words of Baruch, had written to Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Take another scroll and write it on all the words that were on the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, burned up. Here's the bottom line. You can never get rid of the word of God. It's permanent and it's forever. Are you with me here, church? You see, we understand this. Scissors may indeed cut paper, scriptures. But the paper and the rock, paper being scripture, the rock being God, are one and the same. And bottom line, the rock is going to destroy the scissors. Are you with me? See, that's our title, rock, paper, and scissors. You know, I thought to myself, we live in a dark time. I think a lot of us are even feeling that with all the financial darkness that's out there. And yet, we live in a time where, for the most part, people do not fear God. There's a lot of people like Jeremiah. It's hard times. And yet, still, people are not turning to God. And so, what scriptures would people cut out of the Bible today? We're going to look at a few of these scriptures that people would like to cut on out. But we know that all Scripture is inspired by God. Amen, guys? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 7. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. There's a lot of people who'd like to cut that one on out. Say, I want the Christian life to be love, joy, and peace. And the Bible says right here, it says, listen, God gives you hardship because he loves you so much. Lord, hold the love. (laughs) See, we need to understand where hardship comes from. Yes, hardship can come from a man. Yes, hardships come from Satan, but ultimately we need to understand this. God is sovereign. That means that in this entire world and in your life, everything that happens, either God made happen or he allowed it to happen, and there's a purpose behind it. Let's keep reading. In your hardship is discipline. God's treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? And if you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then You are illegitimate children, not true sons. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respect them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. He says, God's ultimate purpose to send you through a hard time is to produce a harvest of righteousness in your life for you to become holy, for you to become a better Christian. But look at verse 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. For a lot of us, how do we handle hardship? Instead of submitting to God and seeing God working, we become bitter towards the hard times that our life is going through. And so ultimately you have two decisions right here. Number one, are you going to decide that God is sovereign? Are you going to submit to your father, God? Now, there are some of us that don't have 
a good experience with our human fathers. But we know that our heavenly father, God, is perfect. Amen, guys? And God is saying, number one, you must submit to my sovereignty. Everything that happens, you've got to understand, is for your good. Either I make it happen or I allow it to happen. Now you have a choice on what to do with that. Either you are going to submit to that discipline and become a more holy, a better disciple, or you're going to rebel to it and you're going to become a bitter disciple. You know, it's very interesting, right? At the beginning in chapter 12, it talks about Jesus. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sins that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured this opposition from sinful men, so that you'll not grow weary and lose heart. You know, right here, he makes an analogy that the Christian life is like a race. Dare we say, like a marathon. And yet I believe that evangelical Christianity has put into our minds the older you get, the easier life is supposed to get. I mean, you're supposed to make more money as you age. You have more prestige as you age. And then you get to retire and you do nothing. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and your life is just awesome. And then you die. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. But biblically, that's not the view at all. As in a race, let me tell you something. Mile 15 is a lot tougher than mile 5. And mile 24, oh baby, that's a tough one. That's tougher than 15. See, we have such a worldly mindset when it comes to Christian life. And so right here, he says, well now, what stops us from persevering? What makes us grow weary and lose heart? He says, well, look at Jesus. He persevered because of the joy set before him of the cross. The, the cross was horrific, but the joy before him was the salvation of mankind. He says, therefore, consider Jesus, who endured this opposition from sinful men, people that hurt him, and do not grow weary and lose heart. Do not quit the Christian race. You know, when I think of two people that love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, I think of Carlos and Lucy Mejia. Oh, yeah. They're the ones that introduced the service up here. And uh, Carlos and Lucy became awesome disciples here in Los Angeles in the 90s. And uh, then they met each other. Amen. <laughs> they got married in the Lord. They got to see their dreams become a reality. They, they, they got to go into the full-time ministry. But then after a period of time, it was almost like the perfect storm moves in on their lives and on their faith. First of all, they're fired from the ministry because there's not enough money to pay them. Secondly, there are financial hits that started to come into their life because as many Americans, we've gotten greedy, haven't we? And they began to be hit by their own sin there. And then something else crept into their marriage. It's there began to be a lot of trouble in their marriage that centered in, in their sexual life. And I'd ask Carlos if I could share these things because Carlos was molested as a little kid. And so this perfect storm crashes. I mean, it just accumulated one day when Lucy couldn't handle it anymore and throws a box of waffles at Carlos. <laughs> and Carlos was not to be seen for three days. Both of these people were hurting, and they knew they were in trouble. Some would go, well, where's God? What we find in the scriptures, endure all hardship. As from God. God either makes everything happen, or he allows it to happen. Over time, they started to get help from different disciples. And then the Holy Spirit brought them into Elena's in my life. And I still remember the first time I got with Carlos, and I showed him a scripture. Go over there, Luke chapter 5. Right after Jesus 
called Levi or Matthew to follow him. Levi throws this party in Jesus' honor. In verse 29, Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to the disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. You can always count on Jesus to step in there and say what needs to be said when it needs to be said. Amen, church? Well, what was Jesus saying, right? Well, here's this tax collector, this sellout Jew who was taxing his own people for the sake of the Romans. And he was so fired up to now be a follower of Jesus. And he invites his tax collector and sinner friends on over, as well as the Pharisees. And the Pharisees go, I can't believe this rabbi Jesus is hanging with these sinners and tax collectors. And so they were too chicken of Jesus, so they're going after his disciples. Say, why does does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus speaks up and says, hey, it's not the healthy we need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. What was he saying? Well, I think quite simply this. A little tongue-in-cheek on this one. He says, listen, the doctor... That's Jesus. He's the great physician. Amen, guys? The righteous, he was saying, well, these people, they're already doing fine. They're healthy. But, of course, he was actually saying they really weren't. They just didn't know they were sick. So to be righteous is to be healthy. To be sick is to be a sinner. And it was the doctor that came to heal the sick, was it not? And so what heals the sick? Well, it says right here. He says, but the sick, I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. What heals the sick? Repentance. What had happened to Carlos and Lucy was very simply this. This incredible, perfect storm of financial problems, brokenhearted from a lost dream. You ever been there? And then marriage problems just come, and it shatters their faith. And they were down, and they were bitter, and they were depressed. What was the answer? Well, it's very simple this. A lot of people go, well, why did God allow the molestation? That's so evil, and it is evil. And there's so much evil in this world. But God had a purpose. He knew that Carlos could endure that. Why? Well, there was a time that he was very bitter about it, and he was resentful. And so what did the healing take? It took repentance and forgiving those that hurt him, just like Jesus. When he was called to repentance, then came the healing, not only in his own personal life, but in his marriage. And then Lucy followed And now, of course, they're one of the most fruitful couples in the whole church. But here's the thing that's unique about it. Not only are they effective as far as winning people to Christ and baptizing, not only are they awesome calling in the remnant people that are hurting out there that have lost their faith, but some of the couples, and we have several couples in our church where one of the individuals, either the man or the woman, have gone through molestation and it's just paralyzed them. It's just killed their sexual relationship. And you know what? Carlos and Lucy do now, they get with these people and they share how God has allowed them to overcome and this frees these other people up to forgive and be free and to receive the salvation of God. You see, ultimately speaking, we go through hardships so we can become a better individual so that we can minister to other people and help even more people get to heaven. Does that fire you on up or not? Well, that's the first scripture some would like to cut out. Let's go to another one people like to cut out. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus says, hey, the gate to heaven is narrow. And only a few. And yet, recent surveys have said that in America, 80% of us believe that if we died today, we would go to heaven. That doesn't seem to match up right there. And so, 
when you read a scripture like this, it says only a few are going to get in, but you're in the 80%. You go, oh, that one's got to go. We got to cut that one on out. Well, let's see if we can understand what really having a relationship with God is all about. Turn to Isaiah chapter 59. In Isaiah chapter 59, a principle of God is laid out in a very straightforward way. In verse 1, it says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. The Bible teaches that sin separates an individual from God. And it's not God that separated himself from us, but we have built a wall between us and him. We've separated ourselves from him. So what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to have a personal relationship with God? Our sin must be eradicated. Our sin must be forgiven. Are you with me right here? Turn to Acts chapter 2. This is on the day of Pentecost. Peter is speaking to thousands of people in Jerusalem. And he ends his sermon in verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucify, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 40. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accept this message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to the number that day. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Well, let's look at this. He preaches to this crowd of thousands. And he says, You need to understand that this Jesus you all crucified. Well, how could everybody in the crowd have crucified Jesus? Did they, did they stand there with, in front of Pilate and say, we want Barabbas freed instead of Jesus? No, a lot of these people weren't in town. Did they pound the nails personally into his hands? Not at all. Why did Peter accuse everybody in the crowd of crucifying Jesus? Because everybody sinned and Jesus died for the world's sins. Amen. Now, the moment the people realize this, they're conscious stricken. They're cut to the heart. They go, wow, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I now see my sins are responsible for crucifying him. Well, well Peter, what do we do now? He says, very simple. You need to repent. You need to make the decision to be a disciple. And then you need to be baptized, immersed for two reasons. Number one, the forgiveness of sins. How important is that? Well, that's essential. That's what cut us off from God in the first place. So at what time do we get a personal relationship with God? After we have faith, after we repent, after we become a disciple, and then we're water baptized to have all of our sins forgiven. Is that awesome or not? And then God gives us the Holy Spirit to give us the power to live the Christian life, something that we couldn't do by the flesh. Amen? You know, uh, Friday night, we had our uh, all-campus and teen devotional. Oh, yeah. And it was incredible. We had about 50 kids there, and it's, it's been amazing. I really want to come in. All of our campus and teen groups has been great because we've sent a lot of young people out on mission teams to Honolulu and, and to New York City, and uh, the Lord's working powerfully in those places. But it's a hit relationship, isn't it, when we send people on out? But I mean to tell you, on Friday night, all of us young people gathered together... <laughs> And it was an incredible experience. It was awesome. And what I'm working with the, the group right now on is learning how to worship. We sang about 15 songs in about 30 minutes. Some vigorous songs at the beginning, more solemn songs there. And then we ended up with Rise Up, O Men of God. But as, as awesome as that was, the highlight had to be at the very end. When our new brother, Eddie Alvarado... <sighs> brought up his friend, Kyle Ventura, and said, Kyle is going to be baptized tonight. And, and it, was, it, was, it, was, it was very moving. 
And uh, they're, they're high school buddies. And you could, you could feel the love right there. And yet you also could sense the sincerity that Kyle had. He understood this was the biggest decision he is ever going to make. He shared the challenges of making the decision. That he had to give up his old traditions. And then, of course, the two questions were asked. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And what is your good confession? He said, Jesus is Lord. Well, we were all excited. We're fired up. So Vic Jr. had said, well, we can baptize him there at UCLA campus because there's a pool there at UCLA, a fountain. And so we, we had this group of 50 going through the campus, you know, about 9, 10 at night, trying to find this fountain. We get to the first fountain, no water. <laughs> they just drained it. No kidding. They just drained it. People are going, well, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? Then one of the visitors goes, I know where a fountain's at. So everybody goes heading off to this part of the campus. No water. Now you got to have water or you can't have a baptism. Baptism means to immerse. Well, praise God. The sisters live in a place with a swimming pool. And Kyle was baptized. Amen, guys. Now, some people, they'd like to cut out that repentance part. Just, just keep the faith. Other people want to cut out the disciple part. And still others want to cut out the baptism part. But you know some like Jehoiakim, you can't do that. You can't cut it out. All scripture is inspired by God. Amen. Well, let's look at another scripture that some might cut out. Certainly not, not any of you. In John chapter 15, we read these words in verse 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Jesus is talking right here. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obey my teachings, they will obey yours also. Wow. Jesus says, if you're following me, you're going to be persecuted. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Where's the peace and the love and the joy? See, the Bible says right here very clearly, if I'm persecuted and you're following me, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be slandered. People are going to twist your words. People are going to put you down and label you with names. That's exactly what they did with Jesus. And you say, but why? Well, it's very simple. We get an insight right here when it says, if they obey my teachings, they'll obey yours. You see, when you teach, when you speak out, they feel condemned. There are two areas the world feels condemned by those who follow Christ. Number one is in doctrine, and number two is in life. And the world will persecute us as a backlash to try to protect itself. Saying, I'm all right with God, when in fact, they're not. You know, you've just got to ask yourself personally. I mean, are you really following Jesus? If you are, you're going to be persecuted. Are you in a church that's controversial? If you're not, you're not being persecuted. How can that be Jesus' church? If you're a follower of Jesus, you will be persecuted. You know, one thing that I've learned is that, in essence, our lives are not just a marathon. They're a journey of learning the truth, are they not? One of the brothers that I love a lot is Victor Gonzalez Sr. And uh, just by chance, we were talking late last night. It's about different things in the ministry. And, and uh, I was just talking to him about the, the Latin ministry. And, you know, the church here has only been going on for... For, for really 17 months. And the Lord, through Victor and Sonia, has grown the Latin ministry from eight disciples to 41 disciples. Is that awesome? And for those who don't know, we have a separate Spanish-speaking service uh, in another room. And I really admired Victor, and we just started talking. 
And for some reason, I, I'd never really gotten into the story of Victor becoming a disciple. And so you know how you go, now, Victor, tell me, what, what, was, what, was it, what were you like when you were a kid? He says, well, I grew up in a very traditional church where they baptized babies. And I used to go to Mass almost every morning with my grandma at 6 a.m. in the morning. I thought, oh, that's, that's cracking. He says, and you know, I had absolutely no persecution at that point. I thought, oh, that's interesting. I said, well, well, what happened? He says, well, one of the big turning points is when I came to America. He's from Mexico. When I came to America, I met this girl in the streets. And she says, do you believe in the Bible? He goes, well, yes, I believe in the Bible. And so they started to be friends and started to study the Bible together. And they moved in together. And she was studying with Victor about the fact that Jesus was not God. Well, they'd almost study almost every night. And Victor says, after a few weeks, I came to a conviction on two things. Number one, Jesus is God. And number two, this girl and I were living in sin. He says, when I broke it, I got my first persecution. Because you're persecuted for life and doctrine. He was taking a stand and saying living together is not of the Lord. So he goes about and at this point he decided he wanted to make money by selling Bibles. (laughs) It's a true story. I'm not making it up. You can't make up stuff like this. (laughs) And one day as he was selling Bibles, he saw a group of young people outside of this one church building. And he goes on over and he says, uh, do, do you guys believe in the Bible? He says, oh, yeah, we're a Bible church. He goes, man, I've been looking for a Bible church. And so he starts going. Pretty soon he studies, and they show him a couple scriptures. says, Victor, here's what you do. You need to understand, you don't start following God when you're a little baby. You have to be adult. You have to be born again. What you need to do is to pray Jesus into your heart, and you'll become a Christian, and you'll be saved. Oh, Victor was so fired up. He praised Jesus' heart, and then he also finds his wife to be, Sonia, in that fellowship. Well, Victor becomes a leader. He not only becomes a preacher, he has his own radio show. I mean, he is fired up about God. Well, eight kids later, (laughs) Vic Jr. is playing baseball with a disciple's kid from the church. They meet each other. Victor and this disciple start studying the Bible. And Victor was just enraged. This guy was saying that you had to be a disciple and that you had to be baptized for the remission of sins in order to be saved. And he'd been a preacher for many years and had a radio show. How can you be lost if you've been a preacher and have a radio show? But you know, he would put up, Victor said, I'd put up a super big fight with the disciples. And then I'd go home and just totally question myself. Because I knew the scriptures were the truth. Finally, after a couple of weeks, he calls out the brothers. He goes, I'm ready to become a true Christian. I'm ready to become a disciple. And my wife is now ready. I've been studying with her. We're both getting baptized tonight, and they both baptized. Amen, guys? Now, when he made that decision, then he got a lot of persecution from his family. Because this went against the family traditions. Do you notice, see, the closer you get to the truth, the more persecution that you get. Well, of course, now Victor's building not only a great ministry here, but he's built a great ministry in Portland. He's building a great Latin ministry in Chicago. And let's just put it this way. Victor's not the most popular guy in many places. (laughs) Why? Because the man takes a stand for the truth. He calls people to live the life, and he calls people to go by the true doctrine. See, Jesus was right. 
if I'm persecuted, you're going to be persecuted. And you dare not cut that scripture out. Amen? Let's move on. Come on. This is a scripture that Elena wanted to cut out a few times. No, I don't just, I just, I'm just wanting to be open right here. If you've, if you've not been in our church before, we're very open about our lives and, and share about our sins and, and, and other people a little bit. But. Ephesians 5. Verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ the head of the church's body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. I love that scripture. <laughs> And as, as, as a young husband, I was stupid enough to show it to my wife several times. Now, by chance, after a few times of showing it, and you got to admit it, I mean, it's, it is a challenging scripture, is it not? To wives, submit to your husbands and submit to, well, submit to your husband in, in everything. And, and just as the church submits to Christ, you're supposed to submit to your husband as if he's Jesus. That's, I see nothing wrong with that scripture. I think it's a good one. But so after about the fourth time showing this scripture to her, she goes, well, Kip, look at verse 21. Okay, what's it say? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Yeah, babe, but look at verse 22 right there. She says, well, babe, then you need to look at verse 25. Husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Wow. Wow, I, I kind of like the 22 to 24 part. Because this one said, I'm responsible for my wife's spiritual well-being. See, there's a very easy way to tell if you have a good marriage. You look at the woman and see if she's radiant. If she's not radiant, you're tanking it. So Jesus presented a radiant church. And it's kind of interesting. He says it's the husband's responsibility to serve the wife and to cleanse her with the word to make her holy, and I find it a little bit humorous right here, so that she will be without stain, wrinkle, or blemish. What do women hate? Stain, wrinkles, and blemishes. <laughs> now we're talking about spiritual ones right here. A spiritual stain, a spiritual blemish, spiritual wrinkle. <laughs> but the husband, in fact, is to submit and serve the wife. And the wife is to submit and serve the husband. And in that sense, there's unity. Now, it is interesting to me in this age of opinions in our churches that people have a question about, quote, consensus leadership or one-man leadership. Even when there are two people, God appoints a leader. <sighs> Not that it's the sharpest guy. A lot of our wives got a few IQ points on this, guys. <laughs> right, Jack? Come on. Amen. Come on. But see, in order for there to be unity, there's got to be a submission. There's got to be a leadership. And so, you know, can you imagine a church without a leader? A group of churches without a leader? If God says, hey, you've even got to have a leader when there are two people just to keep them unified. I mean, after all, who's going to settle the ultimate dispute? McDonald's or Burger King? <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, I think it is very important for us husbands to, to set a spiritual tone. For many years, Elena and I prayed every night before we go to bed. 
When the kids were in the house, we used to have a devotional every week, family devotional. You want to keep it spiritual. You want to build a spiritual home. There's so many unwholesome things that are happening in our schools and, and in our neighborhoods and in our streets. You know, it's, it, some people don't know this, but uh, in, in the 90s, um, Elena worked part-time as an actress and a model. And uh, so from time to time, they wanted me too, but, you know, I mean, I had to preach. But from time to time, we'd go to these, uh, these parties, and she'd always take me with her, which I appreciated. And uh, I'll never forget one of the first ones thrown by uh, her, what, what, what is it called? Uh, agent. Your, her agent. Gilarus, and, and so we go on in, and we're meeting all these people. Of course, first thing is, are you two together? See, people don't even know, are you together? Don't want to say the word marriage, because, you know, that's uncomfortable, and you don't know. <laughs> so we say, yeah, we're married. And Elena, you know, I mean, she's, she's always a little bit outspoken. She goes, yeah, we've been married 18 years. <laughs> no, I'll never forget. person goes, I don't think I know anybody that's been married 18 years. And she just looked at us like, whoa, that's awesome. Well, you know, now we're up to 32 years. And um, that's not because Elaine and I don't have our shortcomings. It's because Jesus is Lord of our lives individually. And as he's Lord of our lives individually, we draw closer and closer to God, and we're closer and closer to each other. We also need discipling. Let's face it, there are times we have a disagreement, a bump, a fight. <laughs> and you got to have brothers and sisters come on in and love up on you and speak the truth of love. I mean, it, is just, it just saddens my heart to see so many people who have left churches because there's no discipling and now their marriages are shattered or many people have gotten a divorce because there's no one else in their life. Are you with me right here, guys? Now, I'm very lucky because not only do I have the church and the discipling in Elena, but I've got great parents. Uh, Mom and dad have been married 56 years. Amen. Is that awesome? Amen. Got one more scripture that some might be tempted to toss out. Revelation chapter 3. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 14. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds. Oh, baby. You could stop right there and that'd be convicting, isn't it? God knows what you're all about. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say that I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be honest and repent. <clears throat> you know, we need to understand there's a huge difference between being weak and being lukewarm. To be weak is someone that is, is striving still to follow the Lord. They've got their challenges, they've got their problems, but they know they're weak and they're still trying to do the will of God. Contra that is a lukewarm person who's gotten themselves into a state that they're essentially unaware of how far they've drifted from God. As a matter of fact, Right here, Jesus says a couple of things. He says, uh, he says, because you're lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Huh. What? What's he talking about? Well, we understand that. Take tea. You either want iced tea or you want hot tea. Anything in between, you go, spit it out. But we need to get a conviction here. Jesus says... If you're lukewarm, you make me nauseous. That's how detestable lukewarmness is to him. 
He says, I wish you were either hot or cold. Now, that doesn't make sense to some of us. I mean, I mean, isn't lukewarm closer to hot and being fired up than, than cold? Well, perhaps a little story from my college days will help. I remember coming in one Saturday morning from playing brothers football. And I came in about 11.30, maybe quarter to 12, to the fraternity house. And my fraternity house had this huge shower area. And nobody was taking a shower, but, I, you know, it's all grungy. And, you know, sometimes you pull a few muscles and stuff like that. So I got the shower going just perfect. As a matter of fact, I had a couple of things coming, shooting on in. Got the hot going, got the cold going. It's coming. I go, you know, I saw a chair out there in the hallway. So I got the chair, <laughs> sat down there, and just enjoyed myself. Just the water, the perfect temperature. <laughs> Close my eyes, and you're not going to believe it. One of my fraternity brothers, who called himself a disciple, <laughs> came on in and saw my weakened state, <laughs> turned off the hot water. Praise God, it was the hot he turned off. <laughs> Cold water comes on. I go, whoa, what's wrong? Wow. I, I, I wasn't going to kill him, but I would do a few things that weren't too good, but... <laughs> You, I knew exactly where I was at. I was standing under freezing cold water at 11.30 in the morning. I was totally, totally freezing. Now, why tell that story? Because, you see, when you're in a lukewarm state, you really don't know you're lukewarm. You're just comfortable. <laughs> but if you're cold, you know you're under cold water. And by golly, if you're under hot water, scalding hot water, you know you're hot. <laughs> well, let's just see if we understand. If you're cold... Eh, you're hardly ever going to church, not reading your Bible, hardly at all, never sharing your faith, rarely praying, not praying with your wife. Is that pretty cold? Hot. Well, this is a person sharing their faith every day, in the scriptures every day, praying every day, being spiritual with the family every day. Is that, that, that pretty hot? Okay, now, now ask yourself a question. Are you cold? Or are you hot? If you're neither hot or cold, then you're what? Wow. And Jesus has serious words for that. See, the danger is you go very often from being fired up in the Lord to being weak. Then you fade into lukewarmness. And then you fade out of the church. You know, last week we had two incredible restorations with uh, Heather and Tao. Amen? Amen? Now, Heather had just quit going to church altogether. Tao, he'd started going to the denominational church because you can get weak doctrinally. You know what I'm talking about? But I mean, it was awesome when they came back to the Lord and to see the hearts that they had about being restored to God. Is that awesome? Amen. You know, we got some sad news uh, just the other day. Michael Williamson called me up and told me that his aunt had died. And Michael's already lost his mom. And so for his mom's sister to have died, that's a huge hit to him. And he says, you know, she was only 51 years old. I'm going, I'm 54. And we just talked a little bit. And I said, Michael, this is, I am so sorry. He was just really hurting. And I said, you know, Michael, you, you got to understand, though, this is why we're Christians. This is why we're disciples. This is why we share our faith. And bro, God has us go through tremendous amounts of hardship, but there's always a purpose that ends in salvation. He's going to be going on up this weekend and helping to do the funeral and then going to be preaching for the Portland group. And I tried to encourage him. I said, you know, I had, I had a very tough assignment, and I was very close to all four of my grandparents. And each one of them I was asked to do the funeral, and that's, that's really hard. But on one of my grandfathers, when he died, I remember getting into a really intense talk with my little sister right after the funeral. I mean, we just, we just got into it. You know how sometimes you just get into it with your little sister? <laughs> and Dana's about 10 years younger than me. And my brother Randy had become a Christian 14 years before. And Dana had gone all over and <laughs> did a whole bunch of different things. Make a long story short, she was there with her husband. We had an intense talk about God, about heaven, and about hell. 
Eight days later, Dana and Bob were baptized into Christ. You see, God has a purpose behind everything. And the ultimate purpose is salvation. What God is all about is getting a personal relationship with us. Yeah? Scissors, cut paper. You can try to cut those scriptures out. The rock, God, and the paper, the scriptures, well, they're one and the same. But bottom line, the rock, God will always crush those who try to cut the word of God. Remember, all scripture is inspired by God. Thank you, and God bless you.